All right, welcome everybody. You will probably um, want to stay muted. You're welcome to have your video on if you would like. I am going to record. So um, if you're concerned at all, we're gonna, we're gonna post this. So if you're concerned at all about that, feel free to turn your video off. We're going to admit people from the waiting room for another couple minutes. Um, and I'm, I think I saw that Mrs. Shiflet's here, so I might ask her to assist me with that um, as we get going. But I've just got a couple more admissions to do. So Mrs. Shiflet, are you there? Aha, uh -huh. well, hello. Would you please admit people from the waiting room for me? I believe I've made you a co-host. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so I switched the speaker view and let me see if we have people pinned. I apologize for that. Let's see. Pin. All right, there we go, that's me. So I'm, I'm uh, up top and we'll keep letting people in from the waiting room. We're gonna go ahead and get started because it's 7.02 and I'm really excited. And students, I hope you're really excited too. We have some fantastic presenters for you this evening with some very important information. Thank you, Isaiah. Very important information. So I'm really excited. This is the first event. As you know, I've been the director of the Central Virginia Governor School for 11 years. This is the first event for us of its kind. So I'm just delighted uh, that we're gonna be able to provide you with this valuable information. What I'd like to do, if I may, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm, I have a very brief PowerPoint just to give you a little background on this event. So it'll just take me a moment to get everything just the way we want it. So let's talk about the origin of this event first. So this Central Virginia Governor School Foundation Board is a group of parents and um, parents of graduates and community uh, supporters, business um, folks who meet to find ways to support uh, governor school students and the program in general. One of the things they did this year, for example, is they're the ones that are providing the hotspots for CVGS families who are having problems with internet connectivity and they're covering all the costs of those hotspots, for example. Well, as they were meeting on September 16th, they were also talking about other ways they might provide support to you. And um, one of our members brought up a concern that he had that you might not um, be sure how to handle college admissions right now because things are so different with the pandemic. And another foundation board member, Mr. Michael Webb, who is a parent of a recent graduate, knew and has been friends since kindergarten, I found out, with Mr. Adam Anderson, who's one of our distinguished panelists tonight. And uh, Mr. Anderson was super helpful to me. I can't tell you uh, how welcoming and helpful he was because I've never done an event like this before. And I had no idea that um, when, you, when you see uh, what these folks do and that they're giving you their time, this is amazing. I had no idea we could put this together and do it so quickly. So I'm really excited and I'm grateful um, to Mr. Webb and Mr. Anderson for making this happen. Now, what's our purpose? This event is designed to help you better understand and more successfully navigate the college application process during the pandemic, because there are some things obviously that are a bit different. Now our agenda for the event, we're gonna have four overview presentations and each will be somewhere between five or 10 minutes. We're not gonna have a clock on them, whatever the presenters would like to share. And the first one will be how to select a college or university. What should you be thinking about? How do you narrow that list? Then how colleges and universities are making these admissions decisions uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I'm sorry, how colleges and universities make admission decisions in general. And then how admissions officers are working with students during the pandemic. And finally, tips for preparing an effective application. So those are our four topics. And at the end, we'll have time for some questions and answers. We did have one student, uh, Addison Chido has submitted a question. So she'll be our first student to ask a question. And then we'll just let you raise your hand electronically. You all know how to do that in the participants window. And I'll call on you to unmute and ask your questions. So our distinguished panelists, and again, so grateful for their time. There are so many other things they could be doing and they've chosen to be here to share information with you. 
These are in the order they're going to present. We're gonna start with Mrs. Sharon Walters Bauer. She's the Director of Admissions for the University of Lynchburg. Then Mr. Juan Espinoza, who is the Associate Vice Provost and Director of Undergraduate Admissions for Virginia Tech. Mr. Adam Anderson, who I've already mentioned, the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Admissions for James Madison University. And Mr. Greg Roberts, the Dean of Undergraduate Admissions for the University of Virginia. Now, you're all muted students and I get that, but you also know how to use the reactions that are in Zoom. So would you please give our panelists an electronic round of applause for being with us this evening? <laughs> Thank you very much, I appreciate that. And so now what we're going to do is I am going to switch to, and, and students, you may want to switch to speaker view. I'm going to mute so that I won't pick up. You were muted, Mr. Smith. I am so sorry. I got a little excited. I <laughs> muted myself too quickly. The students wish I'd do that more often. So. So, so I'm going to let you, Mrs. Walters Bauer, share our first topic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I didn't want to jump ahead because I'm excited too. Students, I am so happy to be with here, you here this evening. It's good to see your faces. I miss seeing students terribly. We spend lots of times in, in high schools, at college fairs. Students come to visit our campus and we are having campus visits now. They're in small numbers and we have some very particular guidelines, <clears throat> excuse me, that students and parents are following, but I still miss seeing your collective faces. So I appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight and showing your faces. So, and I'm appreciative to Mr. Smith for the invitation. This is very exciting. And I know that this is a life and a world like you never thought you would ever imagine or probably even read in a book. Um, so kudos to all of you, and I applaud all of you for your hard work, your dedication. Keep it up. I know that it's tough, and I know you're exhausted, and I know you miss your friends, and you miss many things, but we know that, and we recognize that, and we really want to be able to accommodate you in many ways and work with your parents, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the college search and then a bit about um, how we are working with students. And I know there's some parents on here as well. And parents, I don't know if you've done this before or not, but I have been through this process a couple of times. It is a little bit different as an admissions professional, but it is doable. So if you have questions for me as a parent, I'm happy to hear from you. So students, first of all, I'm curious to know if, and I'm gonna to try to do raising hands because this is an interactive workshop for me. Um, how many of you have an idea about where you want to go to school? Just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you think you want to go to a large school? Okay. Um, what do you consider large? Somebody just pop on, give me a number. Lily, you want to tell me? Thousand. How many? Over 15,000 undergraduates. Okay. Somebody else want to give me a, a different perspective? Over 10,000. Okay. So here's another question. How many of you want to go far from home? Okay. How far is far? So those seem like maybe small or trivial questions, but there's some really simple questions you need to ask yourself as you're starting this college search process. And maybe that means having a little more of reflective time um, on what you enjoy, what kind of environment best suits you, how do you want to challenge yourself. And it's really important to have these conversations with your parents, because if I was in a room with you and your parents right now and I ask those questions, I can tell you that not every parent and not every student would think that they each knew the answer for the other. So sometimes just some general questions about what you're looking for, what size classroom do you want to um, be in? Do you want your professors to recognize you when you're on the sidewalk? Do you want to be in a major that is large? Do you want to be in a program that is small? That's different for everybody. You know, some students thrive at large institutions. Some know that they need a smaller institution. 
But when you are looking at the type of learning environment you need and the challenge that you want, you also have to consider the opportunities. Obviously, your academic program is what you're going to be seeking first. But in addition to your, when you're looking at academic programs, research may be very important for many of you. And what would your research opportunities be as an undergraduate? Um, are there maybe some research grants or opportunities for you to work with a faculty member on their project? If you are involved in the arts, do you want to be in a program where you would have to compete with lots of students for the lead in the theater production? Or would you rather be someone who gets to be in every theater production? Um, same thing with sports. And of course, that depends upon your level of play. You know, some students are looking for the Division I experience and others know that Division Three may suit them better because of their um, ability to play, the time they want to um, spend on their studies. Maybe you're going to choose a major that you know is going to be very demanding and you might not have as much time to, to dedicate to sports as what you might um, in a Division I school. But who knows that everybody gets to make that choice for themselves. Some of the things that you may want to think about, you, have you thought much about study abroad? Anybody interested in study abroad? Okay, that's, um, that's a favorite of a lot of students, but not one that all high school students think about. Um, that has a lot of uh, encouragement and support at many of our institutions. There are opportunities to study during the summer, on the break between uh, the fall and spring semester, maybe a class during the academic term that the international component is over spring break, so it's a shorter time. But you have lots of different opportunities to consider there as well. Um, I think that the type of community that you seek is important. Um, what kind of living learning do you want to be able to do? Do you, many schools will have housing, particularly for first year students. And then you'll have different types of housing as you progress on as sophomores, juniors, and seniors. For us, we start with the traditional style residence hall, but by the time a student is a junior and senior, we have townhouses, apartments, and houses around campus. So, you know, there is variety. Um, you can gradually build into the adulting as you go along. Um, but what you do outside the classroom is important. You will probably be in class about half of the time that you are now. You will likely be studying at least as many hours as you are in the classroom. That may not be true every semester or for every class. Um, but then there's a lot of other time. You have afternoon blocks of time. You have early evening blocks of time. And clubs, organizations, community service, leadership development. There are many things that you can do to start creating yourself as a young professional um, and making connections, getting to know as many people as you can, because you never know what experience outside the classroom could lead to an internship, a job, an opportunity, maybe not within the first couple of years, but in 10 years, who knows? Um, I talked with someone yesterday who said, the job I have now is because of a connection that I made 10 years ago. Someone remembered me. So when you're submitting your application, you are submitting a portfolio of your best self. You're excellent students. You've taken outstanding classes. Um, we love reading your essays. We love seeing your letters of recommendation. But um, also for Lynchburg this year, we are test optional. That's the first, this is the first year that we've been test optional. Um, if you have SAT scores, you can submit them because we admit uh, when we award scholarship at the time of admission, it's based on your merit, your grades and your scores, if you have scores. If you don't have scores, it's on the GPA only. But if you have scores and that could give you a higher um, scholarship award, then we would award that to you. We do whatever is in your best interest. So when you're submitting your information, think about how you are presenting that. And online is pretty much the way to go. Everybody is, is offering the option for you to apply online. Common application is extremely popular. Coalition application is another opportunity for you. Um, it's a much younger organization, but it's very uh, comprehensive. And then many schools have their own application. 
One of the things that I would encourage you to do, and I know your teachers tell you this all the time, and we have to do it all of our lives, is to proofread. Make sure that your numbers are all in the right order. Make sure that everything is spelled correctly. One of the tips I always give students when they start their college search process is to create an email address just for the college search for a couple of reasons. First of all, I bet many of you have received more email than you ever imagined. And if you haven't, if you have, <laughs> Isaiah's laughing. <laughs> um, if, if you haven't, um, you will be, depending on what year in high school you are, it, it grows. So if you have an email address just for your college search, you can have access to it. Your parents and guardians can have access to it. And when all those emails come flooding in, you can create folders for each of the schools and move all of those emails into those folders that will help you keep deadlines in order for each of those schools. Unfortunately, we don't all have the same application. We don't all have the same scholarship procedure. We don't all have the same dates. Um, so this will help you keep things in order and keep you from forgetting. Um, it also will keep this email out of your personal email or your parents email. We know that families are, this is a family decision in many ways. So we contact parents and so I'm, I can imagine they do not want all of the university and college emails in their work emails. So this helps keep everything in a nice order and you can go there and just do your college business and then leave. Um, that's also the email address that you would use when you submit your application. So think about what your username is. Some of you may have some really cool nicknames, but that nickname might not be what you want your official letter of admission to say. So think about that. <laughs> We've seen some funny ones. Um, and when applications come through, we do a data cleanse just to make sure everything's in order. Um, but sometimes we do get a chuckle out of someone's nickname. So just think about that as you are um, completing your, your applications as well. And I know that visiting campuses is really tough. So there are some schools that, that are open to visitors, some are not. Um, and the V word, I know you don't want to hear it, but there are many virtual opportunities. You can take campus tours. You can often participate in a virtual open house. So campus visits, there's, there's nothing to replace them, but where you can visit or where you can find options to be able to interact with people on that campus will make a big difference for you. Um, obviously, if you're an athlete, you're going to want to have contact with the coach. But I would encourage you to try to make connections with faculty who teach in the areas that you are exploring for your majors. Um, or if there's just a, if, if you want to know more about community service, or if there is an outdoor leadership program that you want to know about, whatever you see on the college or university website that intrigues you, reach out because it's all about building relationships. There's a lot of information out there, but it's what connects with you is what makes the difference. And we're all about student success. So finding that right spot takes some work. And I know that not everybody finds the right spot the first time, but that's okay. I know that you're looking at school in a probably a four-year box. It happens in four years for some, it happens in three years for others, and there's some it takes five or six. But usually, usually there's a pretty good reason for that. And we are all willing to work with you to answer your questions, to hear from you via email or phone. Um, however you would like to reach out, we are happy to help. And I think I will stop at this point and then if there are questions later, I don't want to take any more time from my co-panelists. I'm gonna to unmute to say thank you so much. This is Walters Bauer. And students, if you would help me in a round of electronic applause um, using your reactions, very, very good. And Mr. Espinoza, you're next on our list. And let me spotlight you. And whenever you're ready. Great. Uh, thank you as well for including me this evening. I'm really excited to be able to, to talk to everyone. 
Uh, my topic was to focus and explain how colleges make the admissions decision. As I'm sure many of you uh, might wonder, uh, uh, what is exactly happening uh, behind the scenes after you hit that submit button? Uh, there's a lot of uh, mystique and intrigue and confusion and lots of misinformation out there and what actually happens. So I'm really excited to be able to get this topic to, to uh, add some transparency. And I do want to preface my remarks in that everyone's going to review the application differently. Uh, different institutions are, are looking at, at different things. So I'm going to try to provide a, a general overview uh, and hit on uh, some of the most common factors that universities uh, put priority on as they begin that review process. Uh, so, uh, you know, after you hit that submit button, uh, realize that in some cases, uh, your work is not yet done. Uh, your application in many cases is considered incomplete until it receives uh, additional materials uh, that are required from that institution. Uh, most commonly, that will be a transcript uh, from your school. Uh, in some cases, test scores, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, uh, and in some cases, like Virginia Tech, it, it might be electronic requirement, and that's the self-reported academic record. Uh, that's where we actually require you to submit all your courses and grades and test scores uh, online, so you don't have to request a transcript from the school for us. And some other institutions are going to require letters of recommendation and in a uh, fewer number of institutions, some sort of interview as well. So just remember, after you hit that submit button, you got to follow up, make sure you communicate with your guidance staff and make sure you're completing applications uh, so that your application actually does get reviewed. It's unfortunate, uh, but every institution uh, does end up canceling certain applications because these requirements were never met. And so we want to at least make sure everyone gets an opportunity to get looked at. So just please follow through. Uh, and, and ensure everything is done. Now, once we receive those items, uh, your application is then considered complete and is ready for review. And it, it varies a little bit on how that review process looks like uh, at each institution. Uh, for some, uh, there are multiple readers involved. Uh, for other institutions, it's a group read where they're actually reviewing the application together. Uh, and then some schools with larger volume, uh, you might, uh, your application might only be read uh, one time. Uh, so it really just depends on, on the institution you're looking for. And feel free to ask these types of questions to the schools you're interested in, because they will be very transparent and explain what their, their process is. Uh, so once the application review begins, they're essentially trying to begin what's called a holistic review. Really common word that's out there. It's thrown a lot around uh, by colleges and institutions. Um, I think a lot of us assume you know what it means, uh, but I do want to pause and make sure everyone does. Uh, it's essentially a holistic review is a review of you not only in the academic sense, but uh, a focus as well on what are you doing outside the classroom. That is just as important for some schools. Uh, really, it's going to depend on the mission of that institution, what's important, and you'll find that how they prioritize and how much weight they give for the various factors I'm going to cover uh, will be tied directly to the mission of that particular institution. So as I mentioned, there's an academic side and then there's a personal side in this review process. So let's start with academics, all right? And then we'll touch a little bit on the personal side of the review. For academics, uh, obviously there's going to be a lot of focus on uh, courses and grades. So let's start with, with courses. Uh, we love to see advanced level coursework. Uh, it's not because we want to see you suffer. Uh, it's not because we want to make the process harder for you. Uh, we, we like to see that level of rigor because research has shown time and time again, the more advanced level coursework you take in high school, uh, the easier the transition will be from high school to college. The easier that transition is, the better you're going to do in your courses freshman year. The better you're doing your courses freshman year, the more likely you are to come back for your sophomore year. That is a big deal for colleges and universities. That's called the retention rate, the percentage of students that come back for their second year. So that is why we put so much focus on, on the, the rigor and realize there's a benefit to you. You're obviously taking a very rigorous course load that is to your advantage. Colleges are gonna to love to see that. But you might also be able to get a generous amount of credit. And that's going to either allow you to graduate early or lighten out some of your course loads for your first couple of years. 
So the, the work you're putting in now will be rewarded, I assure you. Uh, the second thing we focus on are gonna be on grades. Now notice, I'm not saying GPA, am I? I'm saying grades. Uh, GPA is no longer a reliable indicator of a student's academic achievement. And I see some parents on this call and they know what I'm talking about. Because back in the day, when we said 4.0 as a GPA, there was one answer, straight A's. That's what 4.0 meant. Today, 4.0 means 100 different things. This depends what school system you're going to, the amount of weight you're receiving for advanced level coursework. It's not a great uniform indicator on your academic achievement. So instead, what uh, many colleges are looking at are your actual letter grades, because an A is an A and a B is a B, uh, and a C is a C and so on. And so they're, they're paying attention to the rigor. They're not gonna ignore that. But they also want to see that you're, you're doing this work at a high level. And that's where we're going to be scanning for grades. And that will vary depending on how competitive that, that institution is. Now, another academic piece that they're going to be scanning for are going to be test scores, SAT or ACT. In some cases, the subject tests. It's really important, again, that you ask questions to figure out what the testing uh, requirements might be. Now this year, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? Because the moment this is about everyone has gone test optional. Um, and so it's not gonna be a, a huge wait for, for many applicants this year. Um, but I know we have some younger students on here. Uh, and so there are a lot of schools that might have only gone test optional for one year, and they're gonna wait to see what the climate is like before making a decision on either adopting that on the permanent basis or extending that beyond one year. Uh, but it, it, with tests optional, and, and this was already explained very well by, by Sharon, uh, this, this realized that, uh, that it, you know, there's really no wrong way. Um, most institutions, uh, it's not going to hurt you what, what path you decide. In many cases, if the scorer is able to bolster your overall record, uh, that's, that's what they're going to pay attention to. Um, so don't, don't stress too much about deciding which, which path to choose. And for those of you who just were not able to get a test date because of so many different cancellations, don't stress either because we truly are test optional and we will look at other factors and weigh those in a fair and transparent way. And again, asking questions is where it gets really key to get a good understanding of what to expect. So that's the academic side. And then we look at you as a person. What are, that's important, right? You are a person. Uh, what are you doing outside the classroom? Uh, now, some of the factors that fall under this realm in holistic review, you have control over, and some of them you don't. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, legacy status, for instance. You have no control over that. Mom, dad, brother, sister, a grandparent uh, who went to the institution you're applying to, that might help. Uh, there are some institutions that give pretty considerate weight if you have a legacy or family tie. Another factor you don't have any control over, first generation, neither parent finishing a four-year degree uh, here in the U.S. Uh, there's a lot of schools like Virginia Tech that is very focused on an accessible mission. They want to focus on access. Uh, it's really important to us. Uh, and so a first generation is a great indicator of access. Uh, and so uh, that's not something you have control over, but it's something that will be looked at in, in some cases, depending on the mission of the school, in the review process. Now, a lot of these other factors, you do have full control of. Uh, awards and achievements. Uh, you are an impressive group. Obviously, you would not be where you're at. Uh, you're here for a reason. Don't be humble. I know a lot of you want to back off and, and not brag. This is the time to brag. This is the time to be able to talk about your words, your accomplishments, your achievements. And you need to get comfortable with that because that's not going to go away. Uh, there will be a time when it's time for you to start looking for a job and it's going to be the same type of process. So it's good to, to, to learn these skills now and then really uh, learn how to, to make sure that People are aware and you are recognized for the hard work that you are doing now. Uh, extracurricular activities. Uh, this was touched on to, as well already. You know, your decision and what to get involved in, clubs and organizations, uh, we, we like to see that. We like to see that you're looking for impact in your community. We like to see that you're getting involved. Um, it's a very common question I get you know, from students sometimes is, 
what 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 type of organization do you do you want me to be involved in? And my response to that is, uh, well, what do you like? And then the student's response back is, what do you want me to like? And it just doesn't work that way. Uh, we want you to find something you're passionate about and pursue that. You'd be amazed about, about the uh, number of opportunities that will arise when you do just that. So that is what we're interested in. There's no secret club. There's no specific position uh, that we are looking for that's going to give you automatic admission. We just want to see that you're passionate, you're involved, and you're looking for impact. Uh, essay questions or something else on the application. Uh, uh, Greg uh, is going to touch on that, so I'm, I'm just going to move forward. Uh, he'll touch on the on the, the good and bad of the essays. Uh, interviews, as I mentioned, not uh, I would say not even the majority of institutions require interviews, but there are some schools out there that do. Um, very likely, some schools that you are are looking at, and so uh, it's important that you you prepare for those interviews. Um, I encourage you got some great resources at your school. Uh, rely on them for advice but also rely on your, your family members and, uh, and see if you could do some practice interviews with them. Uh, a lot of this uh, practice questions are available online at no cost too. Um, uh, many of these questions uh, will, will be questions you'll, you'll be asked continually through life, again, once you start looking for jobs. So this type of skill is, is one that will really benefit you down the road. Uh, letters of recommendation. Uh, we don't require letters of rec recommendation at Virginia Tech, but a lot of other schools do require letters of rec. Um, make sure that uh, you find someone that likes you <laughs> uh, when you choose a letter of recommendation. Uh, there was a point where we did require letters of recommendation. You'd be surprised when we, uh, how many bad ones we got. Uh, so when you choose someone, make sure you're choosing someone that truly knows who you are, not your parents. This is about you. Uh, and realize that we're looking for insight of who you are as a person as well as a student. Uh, many uh, chase that impressive reference, uh, but in many cases, uh, if it's someone that's, that's well known or famous, they're not gonna know you in many cases. They might know your parents, they might know uh, your connections with your family, but that's not what we're interested in. We're not impressed on who's giving the letter of recommendation. We're, we're impressed on how well they know you and the insight that they're gonna provide uh, to us. So keep that in mind as well. And lastly, this is something we don't do at, at Tech, uh, but uh, some institutions track demonstrated interest. And essentially what that means is they're trying to, in the review process, uh, how interested you are, if you did a campus visit, uh, if uh, you participated in special programming, uh, that can impact uh, the review process. Uh, there's not a lot of schools that do that, but they do pay attention. Uh, because it direct, directly relates to some of the yield rates of that institution. Um, and that's essentially the percentage of students that say yes to the offers being made by, by schools. Uh, so uh, these are a lot of factors uh, that I cover, um, but they're, they're split pretty well between academic and personal side. Uh, this is just a general overview. Uh, realize again that the weight given to each of these will very much uh, depend on the institution. So please, please uh, ask questions. You've got some wonderful resources at your, at your institution. You've got, some, uh, you've got some great schools here in the Commonwealth, around the country, with admission staffs that all have the same mission, and that is to make sure the process is easy to navigate. So don't be afraid of us. Uh, don't be afraid of the admissions uh, uh, staff. We're here to help you. Uh, you're never going to ask us a question that we haven't got. Uh, so, so take advantage of that, uh, take advantage of our experience, and, and know that we all want to make sure that this is a positive experience for you, regardless of the decision. We want to make sure this is a positive experience. So thank you again uh, for, for having me this evening. I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinoza. Could we give him a round of applause, please, students? Fantastic. Okay. And now we're going to move to Mr. Anderson, and I'm going to spotlight him for everyone. Mr. Anderson, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thanks so much. And it's, uh, it's great to see um, everyone here. I think this is uh, that you, you've done some great advertising because I know for a lot of these programs, we don't have as many people <laughs> as we do tonight. So it's a great job in getting this organized. Uh, 
I'm, I'm a Lynchburg native, uh, so I went to EC Glass High School, so I'm very familiar with that area, and um, I, I'm very impressed with what your uh, school has to offer with uh, going through the Governor's School for Science and Technology. Um, I am not that uh, science and technology savvy. Um, back in the day, uh, just uh, Michael Webb that's on here, I'm glad to see him on here tonight. Um, he can probably recall some days of uh, coming to my house in sixth grade where I, uh, where I turned on my Commodore 64 and we uh, typed in in basic uh, to try to save onto my uh, cassette hard drives. So it was even before floppy disks. Uh, so I, I have lost those skills that I once had back then. So um, it's great to see you. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the, uh, the, how colleges are, are working with students uh, during this pandemic. and. Um, I will, I will say that this has definitely been a, a challenge for us. Um, as we know, for uh, students, you know, juniors and seniors, uh, you, you probably had some trouble researching colleges or being able to do those campus visits and things like that. Uh, but it's also um, has shaken our worlds in the admission side uh, quite a bit because we're, we're learning to do things very differently as well. So, um, one thing that I wanted to really uh, emphasize, uh, and all of you are juniors and seniors, so this is a, a good time to talk about this. We, uh, if you go back to the start of this pandemic uh, in February and March, and a lot of schools were closing, you know, from the high school level, colleges were as well. And uh, typically what we do is we usually have a lot of spring events. We have um, open houses in the spring or Normally you would do uh, get in a car during your spring break of junior year and, uh, and, and travel with your family and try to visit as many colleges as you could. Um, and that wasn't an opportunity to have uh, this past year. Um, and we'll see what the, we're, we're hoping for the best, but we'll see what challenges that'll bring, uh, you know, going forward. But one thing that has happened uh, on the college side is that we don't have as many contacts uh, with knowing what prospective students are interested in us that we would normally during this time. So because some of these larger events that we were able, weren't able to host, uh, we haven't seen as many, uh, you know, prospective students on our campuses. Um, as Sharon was talking at the very beginning, we really miss students and, and being able to show and showcase our, our facilities and, and some of our classrooms and give you that experience. So uh, one thing that's going to be, I, I just want to stress, this going to be really important. Any colleges that you're interested in, um, make sure that you're getting on their mailing list. So uh, typically on every college's admissions website, uh, there will be a place to kind of uh, enter your information in there. Um, and that is typically how we will com communicate with you. So through that email address that you're going to be uh, setting up to do your college searches, uh, make sure that we we know who you are because uh, our our jobs are trying to communicate everything about our schools to you. We realize it's all about um, fit. Uh, you're in a lot of control in that process of uh, you know one school is going to fit you may not fit uh, your best friend, um, but what what you are going to find that's important for that school in your search is going to lead you to our dis different institutions. So uh, do a little research um, and try to do that. Um, some of the different things that we're doing on the college side, uh, we are, I think many colleges are doing some type of virtual um, information sessions uh, where you can learn about the school. Uh, a lot of schools will have recorded tours um, that, are, that are made available um, to you on our websites. And I know um, I said I have a word that I use is exhumsted. You know, when you're tired of looking at Zoom all day. Uh, but, but these are sometimes are recorded things that you can go to, um, on our websites to take, to take down some of that information to learn more about our institution. Uh, we, uh, you know, at JMU, we're also starting to do a few, um, in-person visits. We're keeping those numbers very small. So those, uh, those times are very limited. Um, we're trying to follow all the safety protocols that we can, but some of that might open up or might get shut down just based on uh, what the governor has, uh, has to say for us uh, in terms of safety standards to, to follow. So um, 
keep, a, keep an eye out for that, that there are ways to reach out and to see either virtually or in person uh, some of the institutions. Um, one thing that we are finding uh, at the college side uh, too is we're also being creative with how to try to reach out to students as much as possible. Of course, we're doing some uh, Zoom sessions that we're doing at some different high schools. Uh, they're also, I, I've seen a lot of colleges started to ramp up um, what they have available and different avenues uh, to try to reach out to students. So that could be through uh, hosting chat sessions. Um, social media is also another thing that a lot of uh, colleges are using, whether that's a, uh, an Instagram page or Facebook or something like that, Twitter. Uh, there's different ways to get some of that information. And uh, some of us have our own uh, social media platforms. Uh, we have one for prospective students that's uh, called JMYOU uh, that prospective students can sign into and they can chat with admissions and also students and have that have that ability to interact with us even before they're applying. So uh, do a little research and find out those different ways that you can get connected there. Um, I also, I, I want to kind of talk through some of the different processes. We learned a little bit about how we're making decisions and some of that kind of thing, but one thing that we are um, hearing a lot about is uh, concerns about if our freshman class sizes are going to be changing. Um, I think a lot of students know that um, they might have had some older uh, siblings or friends that, that went to a college and maybe had to go home or they decided, hey, I want to wait till this pandemic is, uh, it has died down a little bit. Maybe they're going to CBCC or you know, a, a community college or another four-year school somewhere. Uh, just where they feel safer. So I think we're we're finding that, but um, you know, sometimes more at some schools than other uh, than other schools. But typically, what I'm hearing from most people is that our freshman class sizes aren't changing at all um, for next year. So that's going to be normal. Uh, that you're going to be in a normal process, and just know that you shouldn't be feeling that you're going to be disadvantaged just based on the time. You know, there are also probably going to be some schools that are really wanting to ramp up their numbers. So it could be a very good year um, to be applying uh, this upcoming year. Uh, one thing that was mentioned um, was about writing, you, you know, we may not want your essay to be all about the pandemic uh, if you're writing any essays for your application. But one thing to keep in mind is uh, with the Common App and Coalition App and many of the other uh, college specific uh, admissions applications. Uh, there are now questions on there about if the pandemic has affected you in a certain way. So you do have a chance to kind of explain yourself and that doesn't have to be the crux um, of your uh, admissions essay. So just keep in mind that. Um, one thing in terms of our review process, because we get a lot, of, a lot of questions about how our review is gonna change. And um, since the World Series is going on tonight, I, I wanna use a, a, a parallel. Um, I think this year for admissions officers uh, is we're gonna have a, a very big asterisk on this year. Um, and what I'm thinking about is, you know, uh, back in my day uh, watching baseball, you know, there was Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, they were going for home run records. And then there was a big asterisk, you know, they, they made the record, but they were using performing enhancing drugs. So, uh, so with that, we, we know there's a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of things that school, that students are dealing with, with this pandemic. So we're going to know that. Um, and one thing that's very important to know is that when you are submitting your application, uh, and typically what's sent along with your transcript, is uh, your high school is going to be providing a, uh, a high school profile that goes along with your application and that lets us know a lot of information. It lets us know about your um, how you do weight grades that goes into your GPA, uh, what types of you know college level coursework that you that you offer, AP or dual enrollment, whatever. Um, but along with that we're asking schools to uh, kind of give us more information about how the pandemic has affected their school system. You know, um, I was learning earlier that, you know, we know that you guys are kind of on hybrid and certain days of the week, you're, you're, you're there at the, uh, at the governor's school. Um, but we're seeing different things all over the, all over the state and all over the country, uh, whether they're in person or hybrid or completely virtual. 
Uh, so we're looking at schools to kind of give us uh, some of that information. Um, and then some of them have done some different things with grading. Um, you know, for spring, um, we were, I, I've been reading some applications earlier today. Um, I, I saw a school system that everybody, if they passed a course, they got an A. Uh, they you either got an A or an F from this past spring. Uh, and then I saw some that were just, everybody gets a passing grade, you don't have a choice. Uh, we have some schools that are saying you have a choice of, uh, of listing that, that grade as a pass or, you know, pass or four letter grade. Um, so we're going to collect a lot of that information from the different uh, schools to kind of help us to be fair. That's our goal uh, through this process is we want to try to do this as fairly um, as we can. And so uh, relying on some of that information from the high schools is going to be important to us. Um, we also know that there's going to be some curriculum changes. Uh, some schools have not been able to offer certain courses um, or they've had to take away um, certain levels, like we can't teach that course at an AP level this year uh, just because of the nature of our involvement. So again, we're going to be looking for the school to kind of give us some of that, that information. Um, uh, Juan and uh, Sharon also talked a little bit about um, the uh, testing and about a lot of schools being test optional. I know there's a lot of juniors in this, um, in, in this Zoom tonight, and some of the, um, the testing might revert back um, after a year, so keep an eye out for that. But a lot of colleges have gone test optional this year. Um, but keep in mind, there are some scholarships um, and some things like that that still rely on a test score. Um, if you think about a donor that gave some money, um, might have put in those requirements that they wanted a certain SAT score. So unless we can have a conversation with that donor to take that away, uh, some of those things might still exist. So um, do some research into that to make sure that it's test optional for admissions as well as for scholarships um, or those other opportunities out there. Um, and so I just want to say, you know, again, we've tried to put some uh, faces to this process. You know, as Juan said, we are real people. We do care about you um, through this process. So um, really do not hesitate at all to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, that is our job is to, um, to be there for you and try to help answer the, some of those questions. You know, as I mentioned, it's a lot about your personal fit uh, with each institution. So if there's anything that we can help clarify about our institution that might be a deal breaker or, or just something that you're curious about, you know, can you continue this that you've done in high school uh, that you're passionate about that you want to continue in college? Um, that's what we're here for, to kind of answer those questions. Uh, so I just want to say, please uh, reach out to us um, so that we can, we can help clarify anything there. Uh, but thanks so much for your time. I'll turn it over. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Anderson. I really appreciate that. Students, if you could give him a round of applause. And we're going to move on to our last speaker for the evening. And that is Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, whenever you're ready. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, I have a, you know, I, I give essay talks from time to time, and um, I have a 45 minute version and a five minute version. And so I'm glad I have 45 minutes. No, I'm kidding. Um, you guys get the short version. I'll spare you. I know that uh, uh, Zoom fatigue is real and <laughs> we've been going on a bit. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of ways I have the, the fun part. I, the, the essay to me is, is fun. Um, you probably don't feel the same way, I expect. But, um, you know, it, it, it gives us a glimpse of your life. It gives us a chance to, to get to know you. And, and that's part of the challenge. That's part of the, the um, like I said, the, the part of the job that, that our, my team really enjoys. You know, you guys are, are human beings and there are gonna be a lot of numbers in here. There's a lot of, um, you know, statistics and grades and, and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, we're all looking to enroll people who are going to impact lives of others uh, on our campuses and who will be impacted by their experience at our schools. It's hard to get that just based on, you know, a transcript. Uh, I don't want to diminish a transcript because it's clearly very important, but, you know, particularly at selective schools, and I, I, I expect a lot of you are looking at some pretty, you know, pretty well-known schools. Um, most of the applicants are, are, are talented academically. I mean, most of them could do the job. Um, so then you have to dig deeper, and, and one of the ways you do that is, is by looking at, at the essay. And it's not a perfect tool, uh, don't get me wrong, um, but I, I hope I can give you some advice. Uh, you know, to be frank, if you, you could Google the college essay and, and be lost for days, 
uh, you know, I'm well aware of the fact that there's great advice um, online. They'll tell you uh, all sorts of things, how to, you know, what not to do, what to do, how to write your essay, how to pick your topic, um, which topics to avoid. I think some of the advice is, uh, you know, I find is, is conflicting. I've read articles that say, you know, write a funny essay, entertain those admission people. And the other ones say, don't you dare be funny. And others will say, you know, write about a life altering experience and others say, you know, keep that close to the vest. Um, so, you know, there are also sample, I've seen some where there are sample essays. Uh, I, I, a publisher, I think, contracted with some students that attended Ivy League schools and asked them, you know, bought their essays to put in a book or on a website. Uh, and it's fascinating because I assume that they think that because the students got into an Ivy League school, you know, clearly they have good essays, but they have no idea. I mean, the student could have gotten in despite their essay for all we know. But uh, so you can get tons and tons of, of information. Um, I've been doing this for 30 years and, um, you know, I, I, I get perplexed by all of the advice that, that I read. So I'll try to keep this, this fairly tight. You know, to be honest with you, um, you know, while you can take my advice, as far as writing and good writing, um, I talk to your English teacher. The English teachers know how to write. I have great respect for the work they do. They've been trying to craft your, your writing style and um, you know, how you look at things for, for, for several years is my guess. And uh, a lot of this is simply about good writing. It's, it's, it's not always uh, necessarily the topic that you, that you choose. So, um, you know, what I thought I might do is I'll, I'll read you one essay uh, and then maybe that'll bring up some points. Um, and then, and then we can sort of uh, go for there. So UVA, we, we ask, you know, the longer essay, which is 650 words, and, and then, which is the, the, the common app will give you prompts. And then we offer, we ask students to respond to two short answer essays of which we give them five prompts. And one of them that we have always used, it's sort of our tradition now, uh, is one that's uh, uh, called, um, it's, it's what's your favorite word and why? Uh, so to get us, um, and we've always enjoyed it, you know, some essays just get stale after a while, but the word essay is always pretty fun to read. Um, but in the spirit, uh, as Adam said, uh, of the World Series, and I particularly enjoyed last year's World Series, by the way, because I'm a huge Nats fan, and it was quite thrilling. Uh, this one just doesn't, doesn't grab me much, but nonetheless, the World Series is tonight, game six. So I'm going to read you an essay that, that a student wrote. Um, here it is. Greg Maddox's arm Roger Hornsby's, Roger Hornsby, and 23 years of 358 hitting. Double steal, Nolan Ryan's fastball. The hometown crowd on opening day. Steve Carlson's Cy Young winner on a last place team. Suicide play and sacrifice fly. The Negro Leagues, Hank Aaron, number 715, Shoeless Joe Jackson, and a field of dreams. Game seven of any World Series. Wrigley Field, Hoyt Wilhelm, Hoyt Wilhelm 21 years old on the mound and one good eye. The 27 Yankees, the 2019 Nationals, rookie season, Ted Williams, Ty Cobb, and Babe Ruth. Seventh inning stretch in the cheap sheets, cheap seats, Cracker Jacks, the 216, 216 stitches on a new ball. And Pete Rose, who said, I'm not different from anybody else with two arms, two legs, and 4,200 hits. To me, the word baseball means more than a game played on a diamond with a bat and a ball. It's a word that evokes an endless sequence of mental pictures and a full range of emotions. Uh, it is a word that is always on the tip of my tongue, alternatively leaving a bitter, sour, sweet, or salty taste in my mouth. Baseball is spelled out in the air that I breathe and nudged into everything I either see or touch. It is my incessant prayer, a, world I have repeated, a word I have repeated so often that has become synchronized with my heartbeat. 90 feet is the closest, said Red Smith, that man has come to perfection. For me, baseball is also the closest English language has come to achieving the same goal. So that's a short answer essay that someone submitted. Uh, I'm not sharing it because uh, it, it's perfect, because it's not. Um, and I'm not looking for, for, for perfection, none of us are. Um, but I, I read it because it illustrates an important point um, that I want to share. And, and that is, when you're thinking about your essay, the idea here is to, to show the reader and not tell the reader. So, um, you know, for example, this student could have told us that baseball is his favorite word, but he didn't. 
at no point did he say that baseball was his favorite word. Instead, he showed us that he has this, this passion uh, uh, for the word and for the sport and, and what that word re represented to him, okay? And so, you know, we hear this. I mean, I could, I could hear it in his voice. It was completely authentic. Uh, and he used, um, you know, his senses. He told a story in a way. Uh, he, he, he told us, uh, uh, you know, I, I, could, I could picture it. I could picture him. I felt like I, I knew him, right? And that's sort of what you're trying to do with these essays, because we don't know you, and often we won't see you. But we, we want to, to, you know, put some heart and soul to this application. What you want to happen after all of this uh, is not just the essay, but the whole application is you want the reader to, to like you clearly, but you want um, the, the reader or the committee to, to push for you, to advocate for you, to tell the others that, you know, yeah, this student might have some flaws or this student, you know, didn't take this class when he had the opportunity, but can you imagine the student in the dorm as a roommate? Can you imagine a student uh, doing community service in the, in, the, in the community service organization or you know, participating in, in you know, the marching band. You know, these are the types of conversations we have. This is a very personal process to us. And um, uh, it's, it's a discussion. It's not a formula. There's nothing that's ranked. There's not an algorithm that spits out an answer here. It's a, it's a conversation and it's imperfect. But um, I, I assure you that it's, at least at the schools I've worked for, and I'm, I'm sure at my colleagues' schools, it's a very um, thoughtful, uh, comprehensive, personal um, review. And we have a lot of respect for, for you, and we respect the file, and we want to make a sound decision. It might not be always the right decision, but it's not without a great deal of thought and consideration. So the only thing I'll add here is I, um, a couple more, like five or six quick, quick pieces of advice. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, topic uh, a lot of people get fixated on the topic. If they can only come out up with the right topic, their essay is going to be, you know, golden. And the fact is, it, it's 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 rare, uh, to be honest with you, when the topic makes or breaks an essay. You saw that topic. It was about a baseball, right? He wasn't, you know, you know, curing a disease or or didn't overcome a great obstacle. He was just merely telling me a little bit about, you know, who he was. Um, uh, the most important aspect of the essay is 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 how you approach the topic. It's it's not necessarily the topic. So how you approach it sort of reveals a little bit about you. You know, are are you creative? Did you take a different angle uh, to this to this essay? Keep in mind we're reading thousands and thousands and thousands of essays, and so it's not a bad idea to to take a chance here. You know, don't do anything offensive clearly, but you know, you you might want to take a bit of a chance to stand out. Um, uh, try not to take on too much uh, with your topic. I mean, 650 words is not a lot when you think about it. Um, there's a lot that you're going to have to choose from. I, I've had students, you know, tackle some pretty heavy duty issues. Um, and it's not a bad idea necessarily if it's impacted you in a profound way. You know, say, um, you know, uh, someone who you've been close to has passed away. I, I, we do see essays, you know, re regarding the um, death of a loved one, uh, divorce, you know, moving, you know, those are, are good topics, but boy, they're, they're tough uh, to, to really get a powerful essay in 650 words. People have written books about these topics, um, professional <laughs> writers, and you're going to try to, to sway me with that essay. So I'm not, I'm not discouraging you, but, but keep in mind, this is a limited amount of time. Um, you know, one of my, uh, I had a colleague, I was on one of these panels a couple weeks ago, Wellesley, and um, she talked about her favorite word, uh, favorite essay, and it was about a young, uh, it was about a guy, uh, a young man who drove his sister to school every day, and he, he was coming to the realization that uh, their time in the car as a senior uh, would end soon, and and because he was graduating, and you know what was he reflected on the, these rides with his sister and how much he would miss these moments, and you know it was a small topic in a lot of ways, but um, it had a bigger meaning, and it, it helped me get a feel for, you know, who he was. He was a thoughtful guy. He, he had a lot of character and heart, and I liked him, you know. And, and some of the essay, you're, you're just trying to tell us about who you are. Uh, avoid the five-paragraph essay. This is sort of how we're taught initially. Intro, three supporting paragraphs, and a conclusion. I like baseball because it taught me hard work, discipline, and perseverance. There's your intro. Paragraph two is about hard work. Three is about perseverance. Four is about... Um, discipline 
And then the last paragraph, the fifth paragraph is the introduction switched around a little bit. It's, it's flat, it's, it's boring. Um, you know, we read applications at two in the morning half the time, you know, we're pretty tired. Uh, a reading essay like that's, it's, you know, you don't want to tune out your, your, your reader. Lastly, um, edit. There's a lot of questions about how much help kids get on essays. It's not inappropriate to get someone to, to take a look at your essay to make sure it sounds like you. Um, I was on another panel and, and someone always tells a story about, you know, I'm not sure, I doubt it was actual factual, but you know, if someone, if you're walking in the hallway in your school and you drop your essay and your name's not on it, you know, the claim here would be that any person should be able to pick it up and read it and say, oh, it's, you know, it's Lily's or it's, you know, it's Isaiah's or, or whatever. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but it needs to be about you. And the more people that edit this and, and weigh in, it starts to chip away at you and it begins to, to sound less like you. That's, that's the one risk. You know, clearly you want to, as far as editing, uh, last thing I'll say is, is I remember I had a student last year who wrote an essay about um, bird hunting with his with his father and he went on and on and clearly it was a very important bonding experience with his dad but he kept talking about how he liked to go um, hunting and kill peasants and um, and so he did so word spell check didn't pick up the difference between peasants and pheasants so you know uh, read it carefully is my point and then go ahead and submit so um, that's my five minute version, but uh, thank you guys for having me tonight and um, look forward to seeing if there's any questions out there. Thank you so much, Mr. Roberts. I appreciate that. If we could give him a round of applause, please. And I will switch to uh, my spotlight and then hopefully we'll get to the gallery view and see folks. Um, we do have a time for a few questions. Our first question was submitted earlier by email to me from Addison. Uh, Addison, if you're still here, would you unmute and ask your question, please? Hi. Um, would you guys recommend sending your SAT and ACT scores to schools that don't require them? And just anyone who would like to unmute and um, take a, a shot at that. Thank you, Ms. Walter Bauer, Walter Spauer. Um, yes, and that's a very good question. I would encourage you to send them. However, as because as has been said, um, we are going to look at you in the most favorable light. It would not put you in a negative light. However, there could be a college or university that would tell you not to do that. And their website might give you that information or sending an email to their admissions box um, might get at a very specific school. But I would say most of the time, you could go ahead and send them because if a student were to be more in a, a borderline area of admission um, with, with grades that weren't quite what the admissions committee is looking for, if that SAT is a strong score, that might make the difference. So that's, a, that's an example of how it would be used in your favor. Yeah, I, you know, I, it was funny. I was just, I had a student just wrote me before this meeting and, and was giving me his scores and said, should I submit? And you know, we can't answer those. Um, what, what I will say, and I think we've, we've tried to, to express that throughout today is that, you know, there were some questions about test optional and, and there were test optional schools before the pandemic. And, you know, if you had a, a, a test optional school at that point, um, you know, you could argue that a student who did not submit their testing clearly didn't have testing that they wanted to submit because it wasn't strong enough, right? So you're, you're assuming a non-submission means a weak score. Whereas in this environment, I don't think that's true. Um, uh, lots of students just simply cannot take the test. Thousands, I mean, there are a million students at the start of the school year who normally would have taken the test in, in, in the spring of their junior year who did not. Uh, I've been on lots of panels and, and I will assure you that when schools say test optional right now, they 100% mean test optional. So, you know, if you have not taken it, do not worry. If you have taken it, it's going to be your choice. Um, I will also say, however, that even, so for example, what we do um, is we ask the students in the application, do you want your testing considered or not? 
And if they say yes, then we're considering them. If they say no, I don't even care if they're in the file. We're not, we're not even looking at them. All right. But, you know, you guys have taken some AP classes, obviously, as you, you know, go through high school and you've probably taken some AP exams. That's not what we're referring to when we're talking about test optional. Uh, so if you submit those, if you have a string of fives or fours, um, I'd send them, you know. Um, I wouldn't send twos and ones. Three is a question mark for us. But I mean, point is that, that that's a good indication of, of your ability in a subject that you've recently completed. And I think they can add to, the, to your application. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that answer. Our next question comes from Lily Van Bergen. Lily, if you would unmute and ask your question, please. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, so when you're filling out extracurriculars and out-of-school out of activities, um, how far back and how specific would be kind of acceptable to go? Yeah, I'll be glad to uh, start with that. I think, um, you know, the, the key thing for extracurricular activities is it's not really about the quantity, it's about the quality. You know, I think, um, you know, Juan talked about this a little bit. We, uh, it, you know, you always hear that, um, that everybody's looking for the uh, well-rounded uh, student. And what that doesn't mean is that we're looking for, you know, a student that, um, you know, strong academically, but let's say they're, they're, uh, they play football, they've been playing football for years, but at halftime they switch to their marching band uniform and then play there. Um, and then they're uh, volunteering at the hospital and they're doing all these little things and little bits and pieces. And it, it's not really about trying to accumulate as much as you can, but um, what things are you passionate about? You know, what, what things have you um, committed yourself to many years of, of involvement with? I think um, that would be most important. It, it's not about how far you go back, but maybe how, how much of that is important to you now um, and what defines you as a person. Um, and, and one thing I will say with activities, because usually you just have a little bit of space to um, write some things down, uh, but I would also uh, pretend that your audience that's reading it is ignorant <laughs> about what that is. So sometimes we don't know, you, you might use a, an acronym for a club um, or something that you're involved in and we don't know what that stands for. Um, or you just, you know, you check the boxes saying that you did this 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. But we usually like to get some more information about, you know, why did you choose to put that on your application? Um, you know, is this something, maybe you were the, uh, you know, the top fundraiser for your, um, for your club that you were involved in, or you, um, you know, you, you held some type of leadership role, you know, whether you were a, you know, secretary or president of a club or something like that, or, um, you know, so let, a, let us know about your involvement and your, and, and where your passions are. So we're not, like you said, like I uh, once said earlier, there's not a perfect answer for what you're involved in, uh, but we're basically trying to see what you're doing outside of class and how you're spending your time. Um, one thing I see that a lot of students leave off of their applications is, uh, is work um, and employment. And I, I think, I know for myself, I worked about 20 hours a week during high school. And that was a really, you know, it didn't give me as much time to participate in some other clubs that, that I would have normally. Um, so, you know, letting us know what you're involved in, how you've been recognized, any kind of you know, awards or if you've been promoted at work or, it, you know, and some students are just like, hey, I have to spend most of my um, time at home. I'm taking care of younger siblings because my parents are working. You know, that, that's, a, that's an important uh, thing. Um, and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna say that one thing is more important than another. Um, you know, we're not gonna say it's more important to, to be on that football team than be in the marching band at halftime. You know, we're, we're gonna say, what do you bring um, and, and we're really looking at building a well-rounded class more than a well-rounded student. So we're trying to see what all of those different uh, things that you bring um, to our different campuses and how you're going to fit, uh, fit the needs that we have. Thank you so much.
Our next question comes from Ben Bankston. Ben, if you'd unmute and ask your question, please. Hello, thank you guys. I wanna thank you again for being a part and getting to hear all this great information. It's really good. My question is about the coronavirus specific part of the Common App where it asks just to explain our experience. And I was wondering how you guys viewed this question and whether I should highly prioritize filling something out or if I really don't think it's that big a deal that I shouldn't. I can take this one. Uh, we Virginia Tech joined the Common App this year. So uh, we, we learned quite a bit about this question. I, I think you should prioritize if the, if the pandemic has impacted you or your family in a certain way, uh, please take advantage of that section. Um, it's something we are paying attention to in the review process. It's actually highlighted in our review process um, and separated from the rest of the application. So if anything is filled out, it's read uh, by our readers just as, just as the uh, admissions essays would, would be read as well. Um, so again, if you feel that you've been impacted and you know, there's been a job loss within the family um, or family members have been sick, uh, or, you know, even worse, uh, you know, than that health-wise or, or loss of family members. We want to know uh, the impact it's had on you, um, especially uh, since it's such a key year in your academic career. Uh, so please uh, take advantage of it if you feel that it's truly impacted you. The more information we have, the better decision we're going to make. Um, so err on the side of caution. Let us decide what's important and what's not. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question comes from Isaiah Bradner. Isaiah, if you'd unmute and ask your question, please. Uh, first of all, like Ben said, thank you all for, for coming and talking to us. I know as Dr. Smith said, there's a lot of stuff you could be doing with your time, so, so thank you for coming. And my question is related to testing. I know we talked a lot about how there's optional testing and how that actually is, um, as you said, optional. But if you are taking a test and you want to submit scores, is there any difference in you guys' opinion between ACT and SAT testing? And if there's a difference, is there one that you think is better to take? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Um, the SAT is very much an East Coast thing. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people don't realize that, but you'll, you'll see ACT used heavily um, in the Midwest, but, you know, ACT has just started hitting East Coast more and more, and, and, and people are trying to gauge which one to take. Um, I, you know, I would say one thing that's a little interesting about the ACT is it does, um, you know, just have that science uh, piece to the ACT, which, you um, I'm just thinking from the name of your governor's school, uh, it, it would appear that you guys would would benefit from possibly from, uh, you know, doing something that does uh, does uh, take take that into advantage. But we all have um, ideas at our schools about which which are good scores on the ACT versus the SAT. So um, it, it, it's okay to take, uh, you know, I think we're we're starting to see more people are taking, you know, both tests to see what they perform with. Um, you know, for many years, uh, um, ACT was kind of seen to uh, mimic a little bit better what was taught in the classroom. Um, and SAT was a little bit more about the applying of that knowledge. Um, so you, you'll find some students just score a little bit better um, on one than another. So I, I think if you have the option to, it's worth, um, you know, taking both just to see what you perform best in. Um, and, and to make that kind of decision for yourself. Um, but, but we all have um, ways of knowing what good scores are for us, um, for each of our schools. But, you know, uh, ACT is, is getting more popular um, now than it used to be. So I think uh, colleges are getting more familiar. And if you're applying to some schools in the West Coast, uh, they're getting more familiar with, it, with the SAT than they had been. So thank you very much. Our next question comes from Lily Van Bergen. Lily, if you'd unmute and ask your question, please. I thought of another question. Um, so uh, I know we talked a little bit about interviews and of course it's gonna look different in the probably next year and maybe the year after, but um, would it be possible to request an interview or is that solely based on the college um, or institution that wants to interview with you? Uh, 
I think that you can request the interview. We encourage students to interview and sometimes students don't like that word. So if you go to our website and you look on the visit page, we will offer some options of meeting with an admissions counselor, talk with a faculty member. So um, we want students to feel like it's more of a conversation because you may have information you want to ask, but we're just interested in getting to know you. And it, it, it's a lot of fun to talk to students. And um, our faculty have been very open to having um, Google Meets or Zoom sessions with students. So those are great opportunities for you to meet with faculty. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, it's about time for us to wrap up. Uh, I hope students, you were taking notes. You know I was taking notes. And, and what I have in my notes, just a few things to think about. Um, what do you want out of your college experience and how will a particular school meet those needs for you? Who are you and how can they get to know you? They're looking for the right fit. So it's, it's gonna be the right school for you and you're gonna be someone that is going to come back uh, they're looking for retention issues as well, making sure that it's going to be the right fit and you're going to stay and complete. What are you passionate about? I have that underlined three times. I think er every one of our presenters mentioned your passion, whether it's in your essay or, or it's in some other way, how you demonstrate. I, I said another way, put some heart and soul into your application, right? That really stuck with me. I underlined that. How are you spending your time? not trying to list every possible activity you could be even marginally involved in, but they want to, and I'll just end with this, they want to get to know you, right? Because it's about fit. Those are the things that I wrote down. I also need to call my English teachers and fuss about the five paragraph essay because that's what they taught me. And now I realize it's not the way to go. Um, all of that being said, uh, would you please join me in thanking our presenters again so much? I really appreciate your time. I didn't even realize this is how out of touch I am with baseball. I didn't even realize the World Series game was on tonight. Um, we really appreciate you. This is the first time we've done anything like this. Um, I hope the students agree that it's been very valuable for them. Uh, it's been valuable for me. I have more information that I can share with students uh, in the coming years. Presenters, do you have any last thing that you'd like to share before we wrap up this evening? You can just unmute and do that if you do. I just want to say these were some great questions. I'm really impressed. I'm looking forward to seeing some applications from this group. I'd enjoy it. You know, it's it's stressful, no doubt, and uh, you know it should be exciting. And you know, thinking about where you're going to go, but it's 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 impossible to take out the stress entirely. But if you prepare, uh, and and you you know you're, you're disciplined and you're you're organized and you start early, I think that can help you alleviate some of the stress. But um, but good luck. I, I I do hope that you have a you know a, a joyful experience, not only with the application process, but your uh, your your year academic year. And if you have questions, talk with Mr. Smith or just contact us directly. Uh, nothing would make us happier than to be able to answer some of your questions and follow up with some of the conversation we've started tonight. You, we, I really do appreciate the time that you took because you really didn't have to spend, you know, another hour, hour and 20 minutes on Zoom, but you did. And I thank you for that. Yeah, and just uh, you know, thanks again for for all the all the attendance tonight. I think was amazing um, just to have so many people and so many engaged people um, into this process. But uh, do do have fun with this. Keep in mind, this is not a competition for you to uh, brag about how many schools that you got into. But uh, we want everybody to be happy that they got into a school that that really fits with them. So you know, going back to the beginning of doing that search uh, correctly. Um, finding good schools that match up with what you want to do. Um, and it, it's a very exciting time. You know, I think the, the college that you pick um, is almost like the family that you pick. You know, not the, one, not the crazy uncle that you're stuck with uh, sitting at Thanksgiving dinner with, but um, it, it is a family experience. You know, it is something that you get to kind of choose um, what's important to you, how you're going to be shaped. Um, and then that, that relationship stays with you, you know, for your life. You have the more than just the diploma that's hanging up uh, in your office, wherever you're working. But uh, it, it, it's those relationships that you've made and how that carries and, and shapes who you are. So 
it's a very exciting time and I hope everybody uh, finds some enjoyment out of it uh, through this process. Well, thank you again all so very much. And again, thanks to Mr. Webb and Mr. Anderson for helping me put this together. I couldn't have done it without you. Thanks to our presenter students. Thank you for being here. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks so much. Bye.